Hello, I'm Dean Bertram, and welcome to My Weird Library. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most influential thinkers and writers in the history of paranormal research, and that is the man who wrote the four books collected in this wonderful edition by Dover, and that's Charles Fort. Within this book are The Book of the Damned, Low, Wild Talents, and New Lands. Now, Fort actually also wrote some other books, including a novel called The Outcast Manufacturers that was published, his own autobiography that wasn't published, and he wrote a number of other manuscripts that never reached publication because Fort burnt them in frustration. <laughs> so we're left really with those four major works to contemplate and to consider, and they were the books which had the influence across a number of fields. Now, most people think of those books as being a collection and correlation of reports of strange phenomena and anomalous events and weird personages that Fort collected from various magazines and newspapers and journals of the day and then collated them in those books. His influence from when he was writing, from or at least when he was being published, from the late 19-teens to the early 1930s, and he died shortly after the publication of his final book, went on to have a very significant influence on paranormal research and on people who thought about these type of things, particularly ufology or UFO belief, which is my primary interest, at least academically. It's what I wrote my dissertation on. So when you pick up a UFO book from the 1950s or into the 1960s, the early days of ufology, in other words, it's very hard to find a book actually that doesn't reference Charles Fort, because when people started to deal with this new weird phenomenon or what seemed to be a new weird phenomenon appearing in American skies, they looked to Charles Fort and said, aha, here's somebody who's already recorded tales of what he suggested may have been extraterrestrial visitations and extraterrestrial things seen in the sky and maybe even people being interfered with by extraterrestrial entities in books before our current UFO flaps. Continuing even on through ufology into the late 60s through the 70s and the 80s, a lot of ufologists probably consider themselves Fortians. Maybe they weren't, we'll get to that in a minute, but one who certainly was a Fortian was John Keel. Keel, the author of The Mothman Prophecies and UFOs, Operation Trojan Horse, amongst many other significant books, as well as his regular column in Fate magazine, very much kept that Fortean approach to weird phenomena front and, and centre in people's minds. But beyond the UFO field or paranormal fields, Fort also had an incredible influence on later horror and science fiction films and literature. You've probably read books which were influenced by Fort and you mightn't even even known it and probably seen films where his ideas have trickled down to as well. And that's primarily because perhaps the most influential horror author of the 20th century, H.P. Lovecraft, was very much influenced by Charles Fort. Not only does he mention Charles Fort's books in a couple of his tales, he spoke in correspondences with other authors because he had a very healthy letter-writing life. He and other people, particularly writing in the realm of weird fiction, would correspond back and forth. And and Lovecraft would point out how the books of Charles Ford had all these ideas and events that were, were a rich kind of field to borrow from. And that's perhaps most obvious in Ford's suggestion that not only might we be being visited by extraterrestrials, but perhaps we're property, that the Earth and all the things on it are owned by some other non-terrestrial civilization or race. And that Lovecraft almost took whole cloth as the base idea for what's known now as a Cthulhu mythos, which makes up the bulk of Lovecraft's writing and certainly his most well-known writings, which suggests there was some older extraterrestrial race, which were almost godlike, the great old ones, as they're often referred to in Lovecraft's writings, and they're coming back or they might come back and they present a serious existential threat to everybody on the planet Earth because they're inherently inimical to humanity. So that big part of Lovecraft fiction, which has since travelled through to movies like The Thing and Alien and John Carpenter films and Stephen King novels, that all comes from Lovecraft, which, as I explained, really comes from Charles Fort. Now, his influence has been kept alive 
in many ways too by the fantastic magazine 40 and Times, which is obviously named after Charles Fort. I have a subscription to this magazine from the UK and I've been reading it for decades and anybody else who has an interest in anomalous phenomena, I can't recommend that magazine enough. I also quick pimp of my website sell 40 and style t-shirts, including the one I'm wearing, including other weird anomalous themed shirts from UFOs to cryptids to paranormal stuff. So if you're interested in checking out some cool t-shirts, head on over to charlesfort.org. Okay, shameless plug over. But most people who identify as Fortian, they do so because, again, people tend to look at Fort as primarily a collector and collator of weird reports. So if someone's interested in, say, UFOs, and they're also interested in cryptids, and they're also interested in the paranormal and psychic abilities, then the term Fortian is a kind of catch-all phrase both to apply to the phenomena that they're interested in, as well as themselves. So you can be interested in Fortian phenomena, and you can also say, well, I'm a Fortian because I'm interested in that type of phenomena. Now, unfortunately, most people who claim to be Fortians, probably don't actually follow Charles Fort's philosophy because he wasn't just about collecting and collating weird and anomalous stories. As anybody who's read the complete books of Charles Fort or any of the books and paid any attention while they've been reading them or who's picked up any of the fairly decent autobiographies or rather biographies about Charles Fort, including Damon Knight's Charles Fort, Prophet of the Unexplained. Knight also wrote the the introduction of the complete books of Charles Fort that I showed you a minute ago, to Jim Steinmeier's Charles Fort, The Man Who Invented the Supernatural. The very title of these books, or the subtitles, are suggesting how important he is as far as his influence on the paranormal and the supernatural and that kind of thinking. Down to Colin Bennett's Politics of the Imagination, which has a wonderful foreword by John Keel and is probably my favourite book about Fort. This isn't so much a biography. It's more about placing Fort's ideas into a broader thematic set of ideas. But what that philosophy of Fort's is, is he essentially was interested in recording and collating anomalous phenomena because it was a way for Fort to spit in the eye of the scientific establishment, which he despised. He was actually pretty prescient in so far as he, long before authors in writing in the philosophy of science, like the most significant probably philosopher of science of the 20th century, Thomas Kuhn, who wrote in the structure of scientific revolutions about something called the scientific paradigm. It's why the term paradigm or paradigm shift is so popular just in general parlance today. What Kuhn meant was that science operates within these paradigms and anything which doesn't fit the paradigm is essentially ignored. And that doesn't mean that the paradigm's correct. It just means that the paradigm is popular and has kind of worked like most human sociological endeavours work, when there's a a, a sociological structure, it works almost in a conversionary sense. It wins people to it by its already existent popularity or its rising popularity. So scientists work inside the paradigm of science if they want to be accepted or within the paradigms of science currently. Now, that doesn't mean a paradigm can't collapse when there's enough anomalies or enough phenomena that the paradigm can't explain may eventually collapse and a new paradigm is going to then rise. Now Kuhn says that that paradigm doesn't necessarily reflect reality or isn't necessarily any more true than the previous. It just does a better job of explaining some of these new things that have popped up and more to the point it becomes the dominant paradigm through this type of revolutionary or conversionary movement. Like most again, human sociological endeavours. It isn't because it's somehow this untouchable way we think about science as being embedded in this objective reality. It's just essentially what the popular kids in the scientific establishment follow, and so everybody gets on the train. Now, Fort wrote something very similar to that almost 40 years before Thomas Kuhn. He suggested essentially the same thing, that, that science have the, has these boxes and any of the anomalous phenomena that he was presenting that didn't fit inside those boxes was just ignored by science. It was the damned, hence why 
Fort's first published book, The Book of the Damned, refers to the procession of the damned. When he, in the opening page, that means all of this phenomena is just marching and science is ignoring it. So when people say there are 40 in today, they're not often saying they're anti-science or anti-scientific establishment. It's kind of like if somebody was interested in, say, the trains running on time or public transport being reliable and also like going to a 4th of July parade. They wouldn't identify as a fascist because Mussolini, who was the infamous fascist dictator of Italy through the 30s into the early 40s, on top of all the horrible things he did, was quite famous for these lavish patriotic parades and for making the trains run on time. But nobody said, well, I like public transport to be running to schedule and I like to go and see a good old 4th of July parade because, so that means, must mean I'm a fascist. No, but to say you're a 40 and just because you're interested in anomalous phenomena probably isn't a particularly accurate term. I would suggest something like anomalist, that you're an anomalist and you're interested in anomalous phenomena is a more accurate term. Because so many people who suggest they are Fortians or use the label as Fortian, and again, it's convenient, I get it, but they still think that somehow science is going to welcome them in. That's why they're often so obsessed with getting that DNA sample of a Bigfoot or why they want to somehow find an old piece of saucer wreckage or why they want to get an indisputable photograph of a ghost, you know, or why they take out a lot of technological equipment to capture these things because they think if they pound on the, the doors of science, it's going to open and all of a sudden they're going to be allowed into the institutions or into the scientific establishment. But since Fort was writing... For you know, over a hundred years ago, his first book was published. Have we seen anybody with an interest in any of these things, be it you know the paranormal or cryptids or or UFO phenomena or psychic phenomena, really come in and be accepted by science and change the paradigm? No, we haven't, because that's not the way the scientific structure works, as as Fort suggested, almost again, 40 years before that became a popular way of looking at science in Thomas Kuhn's writings. And anybody today who throws around a term like 97% of scientists agree or the science is settled or what's another, what's another chestnut like that? Um, I follow the science would be one. Anybody who speaks like that is essentially antithetical to Fordian thinking. So if you're a Fordian and you use those terms, you might want to <laughs> reassess calling yourself a Fordian. And it's all really rather sad because I think the great value of being interested in weird phenomena, which isn't accepted by science, is it kind of positions you in an older alternative romantic tradition. And that's certainly, what again, what Colin Bennett was talking about in The Politics of the Imagination. He saw... Ford is a kind of a cultural warrior in this cultural war, or at least this war of the imagination, where Ford's very suggestion about this shifting reality and these things that the mainstream of scientific establishment didn't accept with it was, is, this fascinating, is this fascinating space. And as we try to bring it into science, we're kind of leaving that tradition behind us. We're leaving behind what's essentially the same tradition the Romantic poets followed throwing up these wonderful verses and lines and thoughts and ideas in direct opposition to this modernistic kind of push towards materialism and scientism and determinism. So that, to me, is the real value of Charles Fort. I'm glad I could have a chat to you today about this. Why don't you go and check out charlesfort.org, whether you buy a T-shirt or not. It's kind of the hub for myself and Gender Rail, where we share our show Talking Weird and where we sell the T-shirts and where the festival we run, Midwest Weird Fest, can be accessed. And if you like this video, please subscribe. Leave me a comment. Tell me if you think I'm wrong or I'm right about Charles Fort. And I'll continue to provide this kind of material where I'll chat about books once a week and try to place them within a broader historical and cultural context. So until we chat again, keep it weird.